he developed general relativity around the turn of the um, of the 20th century, so the first decade of the 1900s. Uh, he predicted that gravity should be able to bend light. Now, at, at first glance, that may not make a whole lot of sense. Uh, when we think of gravity, we think of uh, the attraction of two objects that have masses that will come towards one another. And light doesn't have mass. Okay, Light comes in the form of, of individual photons, which are massless. You might think, well, light should not feel the effects of gravity. Uh, but it turns out that, that light does, and that was the, the main prediction of general relativity. Um, rather than thinking about gravity as being uh, an attractive force between two objects with mass, perhaps a, a more intuitive way to think about it is that anything that has mass, and therefore a gravitational field, will cause a, uh, a sort of a, a dimple in space surrounding that mass. You might think of having a, a foam mattress in your bedroom and putting a heavy uh, bowling ball in the center. And that's going to cause the foam to sink down where you've put the bowling ball. And if you take a marble and you roll it across the, the flat plane um, of your bed, it'll roll straight when you're not near the bowling ball. But as it got near the bowling ball, it would start going into the, the indentation that the bowling ball would make in the foam, and you would deflect the path uh, of, that, uh, of that marble as it went through. Um, now, that's not true just for something with, with mass. The same thing would happen for light. Uh, so down here at the bottom here, we show uh, this is a case where we have the sun and the earth. And the sun being very massive forms a deeper uh, dimple in space than the earth was. So the earth appears to, to go around the sun. But from these uh, uh, contours that have been drawn here, you can see that if light uh, tries to pass near the sun, uh, its path will need to follow this curved or dimpled uh, indentation into space. So a star coming from, uh, from this star B coming from an angle that is not passing near the sun, light will travel in a straight line as it, it wants to. It always wants to travel in a straight line. And if there's no mass in its way, it will just travel in that straight line and you'll see a star in this direction. Now consider a star that is located almost directly behind the sun at you know, some unknown distance. Its light will come in. It still wants to travel in a straight line, but it must follow the curved path set up by the dimple that our sun has made in, in space-time. Uh, and that will, from our point of view, make the light appear as if it, it has bent from the real direction it's coming from. And here on Earth, you might see that star as if it were in this position here, right next to star B, when in reality, there could be a rather wide separation in, in angular space between star A and star B. We can look at this from a different point of view, you know, just with one star. If we have here on Earth, and there's, we're looking at a star in a random direction, the light travels straight to Earth in, in a straight line. But if that star happens to be sort of maybe near the limb of the sun or even behind the sun, uh, its light will be that that could come directly to us. It's going to be blocked by the sun, of course. So there's no straight path for the for the star. But light going out in this direction could be curved such that it appears that this star comes from this direction. You've shifted the position of the star, its apparent position, because that starlight passed too close to a concentrated mass like our sun. Now, this is a, a highly exaggerated plot. Uh, the actual shift would be on the order of a couple arc seconds, not the full diameter of the sun, which is like 30 arc minutes. So it's been exaggerated, but this is indeed the concept behind how gravity can change the path length uh, of light that passes too close to that, uh, that gravitational object. Now, the story behind uh, proving this is actually interesting. Um, Albert Einstein predicted this in between the 1905 to 1912 or so um, uh, years. Uh, so astronomers wanted to go out and test this by trying to find a star right next to the sun during a solar eclipse. So during a solar eclipse, when the moon blocked the sun, you could see stars right on the near the limb of the sun, which would be, uh, of course, too hard to see during non-eclipse uh, um, occasions, and to measure whether that star had a shifted position relative to where it should have been. And the idea would be to, if you can see that shift, that implies that that light has been bent because the light is passing near the sun. Um, now, the first opportunity to do this was in 1914. And uh, two astronomers, a German one by the name of uh, Finley Freundlich and an American astronomer by the name of Campbell, both set out uh, to Eastern Europe and set up camps um, to uh, independently observe the sun during this eclipse in 1914. One went to uh, Kiev and the other one went to Crimea. Um, unfortunately, right after they set up camp, the Archduke Ferdinand uh, was assassinated and that triggered World War I. Uh, and as a result, immediately 
uh, uh, countries went to war. Uh, the Russian army marched into these two camps set up by the two astronomers and said, you're, you're not, you're not going to do this. He's not at first. Uh, they, they arrested the, the German astronomer, uh, made him a prisoner of war. He was released a few days later in exchange for other prisoners, but he didn't get a chance to, to take any data. Uh, the American astronomer, uh, because America, the United States was not yet in the war, they were considered neutral. They were allowed to go on and do their experiment. However, it was cloudy. So they did not get any, any useful data uh, in 1914. And, and when they left the country, they had to give up their equipment anyways. So even if they had detected the shift, they wouldn't have had any data to, to show that. So uh, the attempt failed in 1914, but it turns out that was a good thing, at least in terms of Albert Einstein, because it turned out that Einstein had made an error in his calculation. Believe it or not, even Albert Einstein could make math errors. And he was actually off by a factor of two in his calculation. He predicted a shift in the position of, of the star uh, two times bigger than it actually would have been measured if it hadn't been cloudy on that day in 1914. Between 1914 and the next opportunity in 1919, he figured out his error uh, and corrected it. Uh, so in 1919, uh, a couple of teams went down to the Southern Hemisphere, uh, one in, in Brazil and the other in uh, uh, the island of Principe, and uh, did observations of the eclipse uh, in 1919, and indeed, uh, here's an image showing where the star was actually uh, positioned and where those stars should have been if, there, if it had not been near the sun. And the shift that they found was what was predicted by Einstein's uh, corrected uh, uh, calculation, about a one and three quarters arc second shift between where the star uh, uh, was supposed to be if there was no sun uh, in, correcting the path and where the um, star actually was. So this was a great breakthrough. Um, everyone uh, hailed Einstein as a genius, uh, which probably would not have happened in 1914 if he was off by a factor of two. They might have just totally discarded general relativity if, if Einstein had been wrong, but he was correct. And uh, from that point on, even more uh, experiments went on that, that showed indeed that light does get bent when it passes close to um, a gravitational field. Um, are there any questions you want to ask first? I don't want to necessarily just go through all this all in one pass. If you have anything, I see there's some comments coming through on the on the screen. Um, yeah, they, they uh, are in English, and they so so yeah. I'm sorry. But there isn't any questions right now. I don't think so. Okay. All right. Um, so that's that's kind of the the, the history behind uh, proving that that gravity can bend light. Um, now uh, it's not just. Uh, shifting the position of a star from, from one point to another point. Uh, based on the mass distribution, the distance between the object that is being lensed and the object that is uh, doing the lensing, um, a variety of factors can cause all sorts of different uh, manifestations of that lensing effect, um, rather than just translating a point source to another point source. For example, if you have a, a group or cluster of galaxies with a, a, a dense mass concentration in the center, that is conducive to bending light from a galaxy that may lie behind that foreground uh, group or cluster of galaxies. So here in our example, uh, the blue galaxy here in the center is the real galaxy that, that lies behind the cluster of galaxies. Uh, and with, without the bending of light, you would see one image um, of that galaxy right in the projected uh, behind the image uh, of the uh, the uh, the uh, cluster of galaxy, but because light is bent, other rays of light emanating in other directions from the real galaxy are gonna get bent towards Earth. And you may take that to mean that the galaxy, a mirror or copy image of your real galaxy is also coming from this direction or maybe even this direction. And depending on what the geometry is and, and how symmetric or asymmetric this mass distribution is and whether this is right on center or somewhat offset, you can get a variety of different uh, um, uh, distributions for these lensed uh, mirror uh, uh, projections of the actual real galaxy itself, right? You may get uh, the galaxy pretty much intact, or more often than not, you'll get a ring or at least a partial ring around the group of galaxy. So I have a little uh, illustration here. This shows um, a galaxy with this light coming towards the Earth, right? So without something in the foreground, we just see one galaxy that you would expect. But if you put a lens in front, a massive galaxy cluster in front with a lot of dark matter to amplify the signal, from your point of view, you're gonna see that galaxy multiple times. Sometimes it will be as it is in this image, not a nice uh, uh, galaxy looking object, 
but a very distorted thin ring of light. So that is actually an image of that original galaxy that's been stretched out and distorted by the fact that this light has been bent by the gravitational field uh, of the galaxy, of the galaxy cluster that lies in front. And how much of a ring you get kind of comes down to the specifics of the geometry between the, the mass distribution and, and the lens itself. So here's a, a montage of, of just a few of the rings that have been observed uh, over the years. Um, this is a many, many rings or, or partial rings that have been observed around a massive galaxy cluster known as a Bell uh, 1689. So each square shows a, a different part of that galaxy cluster. And you're seeing parts of, of gravitational lenses in these rings uh, nearly everywhere, um, uh, multiple times sometimes in some of these panes. So the more massive and importantly, how concentrated that mass is, the more likely you're going to get uh, at least some sort of gravitational ring uh, surrounding your, your mass distribution. This is a particular favorite of mine. This is the horseshoe lens. It's almost a complete uh, Einstein ring around the central foreground galaxy. So this is a galaxy that is amplifying some background. You can tell it's probably a bluish galaxy, uh, much, much more distant, but its light has been uh, bent and distorted to the point where you have almost a complete uh, and symmetric circle surrounding your host galaxy. This is another favorite that, that people have looked at. This is called the Einstein cross. Uh, this uh, uh, the bluish haze is a, a nearby galaxy that is doing the lensing. And uh, this is the, uh, uh, the core of that galaxy. But these four points are a background quasar that has been uh, lensed four separate times. And actually, I'm told that there's a fifth one that's quite faint in the center that you can't see, but there are at least four different uh, multiple images of that quasar that just happens to lie right behind the galaxy from our point of view, and the light is getting split into multiple beams, and we're seeing four different quasars, but it's really the same quasar. Okay? It's four different images of the same quasar. So we were, we're seeing this, these, these gravitational effects more and more as we get better and better data, and particularly with the, the Hubble Space Telescope, which this image came from, uh, we can see all sorts of lensing activity anytime we look towards a galaxy cluster, or even sometimes uh, you know, individual galaxies, we're seeing more of these gravitational lenses pop up. Right. Now, um, we're going to come back to, uh, to lenses in a bit. I want to talk now a bit about the kind of objects that do the lensing, and that is groups of galaxies. Uh, and this is a topic that I kind of work on more in, in, in my research rather than the gravitational lenses. So I want to spend a bit of time talking about groups and clusters. And uh, as you probably know, galaxies usually don't exist uh, solitary within the universe. They often are formed and reside within groups of various sizes. Our Milky Way belongs to a group uh, along with uh, the Andromeda galaxy, M31, uh, the Large Magellanic Cloud, the Small Magellanic Cloud, uh, the Fornax galaxy, now there's upwards of maybe 40 or 50 galaxies, most of which are really small dwarfs, that have been found that all belong to the same group that, that the Milky Way does. Uh, and that's called uh, our local group of galaxies. Um, how far are these galaxies can they be observed from? Um, all the way across the universe. I mean, they can, be, they can be billions of light years away for the most distant galaxies. Um, most of the galaxy groups that we see are somewhat closer. Um, they may be on the order of uh, 100 million, hundreds of millions to maybe a billion light years away. Uh, we are seeing them farther and farther away with, with better data, but uh, your typical cluster is going to be on the order of maybe 100 million uh, light years away, uh, 100 to a few million uh, light years away. So um, these, uh, these galaxies will form in groups typically. Uh, if it's less than 100, we typically call that a group. If it's more than 100, we'll call that a cluster. But the, the boundary is a bit hazy. So whether, whether we say group or cluster is a bit arbitrary. Um, but they are gravitationally bound as one unit. Okay, they, they, they all orbit a common center of mass of all the galaxies that make up the group or that make up uh, that cluster. Um, and they remain that way for billions of years. If the gravity of the, of the cluster is strong enough, they won't escape. They'll just orbit like, like bees going around a beehive around the center of mass of, of that group or cluster. Um, now, um, if the cluster is massive enough, or even if the group is massive enough, there's also typically uh, a quite a bit of hot gas that sits inside the gravitational potential well uh, of the, uh, of the uh, group or cluster. This is mainly hydrogen gas. 
that came from either the uh, individual galaxies themselves, if the gas was removed, or more likely, it is gas that was around at the beginning of the, of the, uh, the formation of these clusters billions of years ago that have fallen into the potential well and has gotten heated up to very high temperatures. Right? So when you have a parcel of gas fall in, it's going to start moving at a, at a higher velocity towards the center of this collection of galaxies. It'll collide with another parcel of gas, and that that collision will, will shock heat the temperature of this gas up to really high temperatures. Um, on the order of um, 100 million, uh, 10 million, million to 100 million Kelvin, or if you prefer the centigrade scale, uh, 10 million to 100 million centigrade, because Kelvin and centigrade are, are the same when we're at these high temperatures. So this is really, really hot gas, primarily hydrogen. And these um, these galaxies, this is, this, by the way, this is the optical and this is the X-ray view of the same uh, group of galaxies, NGC 4555. Um, these galaxies are basically swimming inside this very, very hot gas. And it's so hot that rather than emit optical light, which you could see with, with an optical telescope, it emits X-ray light. And we see them with our X-ray satellites, such as the, uh, the Chandra X-ray observatory. So it's, it's at this very high temperature, most of that radiation is coming out at, um, uh, you know, in the X-ray regime. You, you would not see it at, at optical wavelengths. So that's true of a, of a, a majority of groups and clusters. They have this hot uh, X-ray halo in which the galaxies sort of swim through one cohesive unit that is bound together gravitationally. Um, another thing I want to point out about most clusters, if you leave them alone long enough, they'll kind of look more relaxed. Okay, the, 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 you'll form a big galaxy in its center. It'll sink to the center. The other galaxies will, will be uh, um, orbiting the center of mass, which will be at the, usually at the center of the big galaxy. Um, also, if you let this gas sit long enough, it'll start to cool off. Now, it'll still be quite hot. It'll still remain emitting a lot of x-rays, but in the center where it's most dense, it'll begin to cool somewhat faster and the temperature will be a little bit lower there. It's still quite hot, but the temperature in the cores of a nice relaxed system that has not had something crash into it lately will be about a factor of two cooler than the surrounding gas. Right? So it's all, it's all hot, but it'll be a little cooler in the center if you have a nice relaxed uh, system. All right, now that's a, a generic group or cluster. Um, I'm gonna talk a little more about what we call fossil groups. And you can see here the two uh, main criteria for, uh, for fossil groups. One is that they must be dominated by one big, uh, typically elliptical galaxy in their center. Uh, this group here also, also happens to be a fossil group. So this, this group, uh, NGC 4555, that central galaxy is bright enough to be a, in the NGC catalog. But all its companion, star, uh, companion galaxies are at least 2.0 magnitudes fainter than the, um, the brightest galaxy. And that, that's one of the definitions of uh, a fossil group. You must have a two magnitude gap between the brightest galaxy, which is at the center, and the second brightest galaxy that is surrounding it somewhere. Right? So that's, that's one crucial criteria for a fossil group. Uh, now, you might imagine, what if you just have a lone elliptical galaxy that has just a couple of, 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 of uh, companion members, would we call that a fossil group? And actually, we, would, we, we wouldn't. It wouldn't be massive enough to be called a fossil group. We also need it to be massive enough that you've had enough hot gas fall in to make it very X-ray luminous, right? And the number that is generally quoted here is 10 to the 42 ergs per second. Now, that, that number may, uh, might or might not uh, mean anything to you. For comparison, the, the luminosity of our, uh, our sun is about 10 to the 33 ergs per second. So this is about a billion times more luminous, more energy per second being emitted from the gas um, than our sun is emitting, if you, if you want a, a benchmark. Basically, you want a lot of X-ray gas in there in order to qualify it as an actual group rather than just a single lone isolated galaxy that, that meets the first criteria. It would not meet uh, the second criteria. Um, any questions that we've had so far? Oh, yes. why are they called fossil groups? Um, I'll get to that in, in just a bit. Um, it's, it's a bit of an archaic term, <laughs> pardon the pun, but um, uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say that in a second. Um, the other one is, do we have a, a catalog of, 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 of groups? Yes, there are large catalogs. Tens of thousands of groups are known to date. Uh, most are not identified as fossil groups. They are just regular groups where you don't have that 
two magnitude gap between the brightest uh, and the faintest. Um, but yeah, there are, there are catalogs that can be found that, that list a whole uh, slew of, of, of galaxy clusters. Uh, the biggest, the, 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 the one with the brightest clusters and the earliest one is called the Abel catalog, uh, compiled by George Abel way back uh, 1940s and 50s and such. Uh, those are the nearest ones and the brightest ones, uh, but you may even want to look up the Abel catalog um, and, and you can start there. But by now with, with all the surveys that have been done, there are tens of thousands of groups of galaxies that are known uh, within our universe that have been identified so far. There's also a son that raised the hand. Son, will you ask your question? Okay, there's also uh, two other questions in, in the chat. Can you see that, Jim? Jimmy? Uh, unfortunately, the, the, for me, my, the, the, okay. the video pictures is, oh, there, I've, I've moved it. Now I can see it, I guess. Okay, um, uh, can the gas be detected as absorption lines in the visible spectrum? Uh, no, it's too hot to, uh, to be able to, uh, um, to absorb anything from behind it. So we can't see it through absorption. Well, I take that back. Um, people have tried to find absorption lines from this gas from background AGN. Uh, so using the, the background AGN as like wallpaper and seeing if you have any absorption lines that are superimposed on that. And, and typically, no, this is it's so hot. It's, it's ionized gas that um, uh, you don't get any absorption because the electrons have already left the protons. And you want to get an absorption line when you when you have, when, a, when an electron absorbs the photon and moves out from the proton. Since that has already happened, there's nothing left to do any absorption. So, so unfortunately, no, we can't see this hot gas via absorption from some background uh, wallpaper AGN. That's another question, uh, just uh, about one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, galaxy groups and clusters likely have very complex geometries. Is there any way possible to digitally decipher, reconstruct, reverse engineer the image of the lensed item? Um, you could try, but I don't think you would have, there would be so many alternatives that could lead to the same thing. I don't know if you could ever extricate what you get from what you started out with. Again, I'm not an expert in, in lensing, but I don't think that's possible just because it's too complicated and you have too many variables uh, in terms of what is the exact mass distribution? Is it symmetric? Is it slightly asymmetric? I'm not sure anyone could confidently backtrack and take those arcs and, and, and recreate the original galaxy that did that. So I'm, I'm afraid that's probably not possible mathematically with our limited knowledge of the, all the variables that go into making that lens in the first place. There's one last question at the bottom of the chat now. Okay. With all these many groups and clusters and galaxies and stars, uh, there should be nothing else to see than lensing, but why don't we at least see that? Um, yeah. And you'll get back to why it's called uh, fossil groups, right? Yeah, yeah, I'll get back to that. Okay. Um, so I, I was just thinking about this question here. Uh, why, why don't we see, um, we should see nothing else to see than lensing. Um, I mean, you're gonna see lensing every, anywhere you have a mass concentration. So most groups may not be dense enough to form or you don't have the right geometry to form lenses. It's only among some of the groups that you're gonna find uh, uh, a gravitational lens around it. But if you can see as long as you said, then we should have enough mass in any direction to see lenses in any direction, all over the place. Um, you're saying that if you look in any random direction, you're likely to have enough mass to form a lens? Somewhere, yeah. Um, in a hundred million uh, billion light years, or how, uh, how long you can see. Um, but there's only a limited number of mass concentrations that are possible to make that, uh, that, that type of, of lens. So there are, you know, I've said there are like tens of thousands of groups known. That's probably only a fraction of what we know, but it's not, it's not infinite, at least as far as we know. Um, the, the universe might be infinite, but we cannot see beyond a sphere that is, uh, um, for which light has had long enough to travel. That is, we can't see farther back than a look back time of 14 billion years, because that's the age of the universe. So within that sphere that surrounds the earth, that corresponds to the farthest away that we could actually, time, light would have enough time to reach us, there aren't enough mass concentrations for us to see gravitational lenses everywhere. Okay. Most regions of the sky, you would you look in the direction where there is no mass concentration that would be able to cause a, a gravitational lens. There's a lot of groups in the universe, but there's not that many, I guess is a short way of saying that. Okay, that explains it. Thank you. Okay, great. All right.
Um, yeah, maybe the same reason you don't see stars. Oh, that's Olber's paradox. If you look in any direction, you're, if the universe is infinite and there's infinite number of stars, your line of sight should always end on a star. Um, that, that, was, that was pondered for a long time by Olber. And it was finally um, uh, resolved by the fact that our universe is not infinite age. It's only 14 billion years old. So why is there, there might be matter all the way to infinity, only that which is close enough for it to have traveled in 14 billion years to reach us, that's the only thing we can see. Um, it actually was the person who, who suggested this first was in a, was actually Edgar Allan Poe. If you go back and read the poem uh, Eureka, he kind of hints at the answer there that it's because the universe has an, a finite age, which is why we don't see starlight in every single direction. <laughs> so you wouldn't think Edgar Allan Poe would be the person to offer the answer, but it turns out he did. <laughs> There's a question more from uh, Sean. How, how far are these galaxies do you see with gravitational lensing? Uh, how far are they now? And uh, how long have the light been on the wave? The, the lens or the galaxy that's being lensed? Uh, the galaxies that's being lensed. Um, they have redshifts of anywhere from one to four. If you translate that into, into uh, billions of light years, uh, anywhere from um, three to 10 billion light years. So they're a good fraction of the way across the universe. If they're, if they're too close, they won't get lensed. You have to have the right angle between uh, the, the, the opening angle of the light coming towards that lens and, and, uh, and the, uh, the distance from you to uh, the lens to you. So the, the ratios of the distances have to be right to see lenses, otherwise you won't see a lens. If, it, if it's too close behind the lens, it won't get lensed. If it's too far in the, in the distance, it won't get lensed. It's gotta be kind of a sweet spot in between. So it, there's, there's many limitations as to why we don't see lenses everywhere. Okay, did I get all the questions? Okay. Yes, I think so. Um, okay, so um, I, I do want to get back to why we call them fossil groups. And I think it'll become a little bit clearer when we talk about um, uh, how, uh, uh, how they actually form. So um, these fossil groups, they, they look like they are systems where you have you know, this one big giant elliptical in the center, a bunch of smaller galaxies surrounding it. And it's got enough mass to hold a, a deep enough potential well to get all these x-rays. How might we form them? And the, the classical way of it are two, two variations that are sort of the same. One is it just formed that way. You formed back in the early universe, a collection where most of the stellar mass went into forming one big galaxy and there wasn't enough mass left over to form a second somewhat large galaxy. Uh, so you, you might just have some groups that just were born that way and they've stayed that way ever since. Alternatively, perhaps when the cluster was younger, it did have a number of equal luminosity galaxies, but over time, they've all kind of sunk to the center and dynamical friction would cause them to lose their velocities relative to one another and they would merge to the center. So if you leave this, this cluster alone long enough, you'll, you'll get all the, all the luminous ones to sink to the center and you'll form a fossil group at a somewhat later time, right? Both instances, you are starting with, with one entity that either was formed that way as a fossil group or later became a fossil group um, as a result of, of merging of the constituent galaxies that make up that group to begin with. Now, you can imagine you can, you can form them this way. You can also, uh, might be possible to destroy a fossil group. If you have a formed fossil group and here comes another group with a big galaxy in it and it merges in with it, well, you've now destroyed your two magnitude gap. It's no longer a fossil group. So a fossil group might be a transitory stage. You might be able to form them, but then you may destroy that status as a fossil group by the fact that you have introduced a new luminous galaxy that has fallen in at some later time. Uh, so that's really why uh, if, if, we, if we ignore that fact and we say, all right, you just leave these objects alone for long enough, every group should become a fossil group at some point in the future. At some point, all the luminous galaxies will merge. It's just a matter of waiting long enough. For some of those, that's already happened, but you might expect that all groups in the future will become a fossil group if they are not merging with something else. It's, it may be the natural endpoint of a system of galaxies that you have just left alone for, the, for a long period of time and you haven't merged in together any new galaxies to it. Now there's a, there's a benchmark and that's why I call them fossils. These are, these are fossils of the earliest galaxy groups that were formed shortly after the Big Bang, right? They are, they are fossils of an earlier epoch of our universe. Those clusters have remained there untouched for five, 10, 12 billion years, 
with nothing new falling into them. Uh, and so they, they are fossils as a result. Now, uh, one piece of evidence that, that supports that at least some of these are, are fossils uh, is the following. Uh, remember that I said that if we, uh, let me go back a slide. If you look at the hot gas, if you leave it alone long enough, the gas begins to cool in the center and you get a somewhat lower temperature in the inner parts than in the outer parts. This is what we expect from a very relaxed system that's been left alone. That's what we find for a majority of fossil groups. However, we began thinking, is there any other way that you could form a fossil group other than just waiting, just having it either form that way or waiting uh, at a, uh, for, a, um, for them to merge together? Um, now, the reason why we might want to introduce a, a third alternative to these first two is sometimes we see fossil groups that obey these two criteria. They have a bright galaxy in its center. They're brighter than any other galaxy. They have the X-ray gas that fit this criteria, but they're hot in the center. Okay, they're hotter than they ought to be, as if something has stirred up that gas and heated it up in the relatively recent past. So in other words, they look like they're fossils, but they have X-ray properties like they're young. Right? Um, and these really didn't have a good explanation as to how you could have a system that looks old from a galaxy point of view, but looks young from the fact that it has this hot gas in the center that is even hotter than you expect it to be. Uh, so we, we, our, our main goal was to seek out an explanation for why you see these fossil groups that kind of buck, buck the trend. They look like they're old systems, one big galaxy in the center, but they're hot, hotter than they should be, indicative of something having slammed into them recently, somewhat recently, that has heated up that gas. So we wanted to come up with a, another explanation for fossil groups that appear young by one criteria and appear old by another criteria. All right, so we came up with the following idea. Could you form a fossil group if you started with two originally separated uh, groups, each one of which had a, a bright galaxy in their center, but they weren't necessarily fossil groups to begin with. But maybe they were, maybe they had a one magnitude gap between the, the brightest one and the, and the second brightest one, or maybe one and a half magnitudes. What would happen if you took these two groups, each with a bright dominant elliptical, and you merged them together? And those two galaxies merged together to form a big galaxy in the center. Could you create a new or, or, or modern day fossil group by merging together two groups that were already almost fossil groups themselves. Uh, so, so that was really the problem that we wanted to address. Um, could you create a two magnitude gap between this new super galaxy that you've created in the center uh, with the two magnitude gap of all the remaining galaxies that were these two groups before they merged together? Uh, this kind of solves the problem. You can still form your two magnitude gap you could still have your x-ray gas, but if you slam them together hard enough, you would heat up that x-ray gas and you would have a young looking fossil group from the viewpoint of, from the x-rays. Um, so this is, you know, it makes sense, but we wanted to go out there and find such examples, right? Uh, now, of course, we can't wait 500 million years for galaxies to merge, uh, but we can look at things that are progenitors of what we think will become fossil groups in the future. And we were one of the first groups to try to search for these fossil group progenitors. That is, what do they look like before they actually become fossil groups? So the idea was look for uh, a grouping of galaxies that look like they're one group, but they have two really big galaxies that are close by. And you can predict uh, mathematically how long it should take them to merge. And then once that happens, you should have a fossil group. Right? And that was, our, that was our goal. Now, uh, how to find these progenitors, we went about using the fact that uh, if you have two groups that are merging near one another, you have a lot of mass right at the center. So that's a, a high mass concentration. And what likes to form around high mass concentrations? Gravitational lenses. So we're using gravitational lenses as sort of like a, a bench, right, an earmark to search for regions of, of, of clusters that have a very high mass density. Those are the ones most likely to be merging today. So. Um, that's a rather long explanation as to, as to the, the motivation for this project, but basically that's why we're interested in lenses. At the center of lenses, you have an increased chance of finding the types of systems that will become fossil groups at some point into the future. All right, so that brings us to probably why you're all here, the Cheshire Cat uh, group of galaxies. 
Um, here's some of the, uh, the uh, specifics about uh, the Cheshire Cat. Uh, it's at a redshift of, of 0.43. Uh, that corresponds to a look back time of uh, 4.6 billion years. So we're actually seeing the cat, we're seeing the light that was emitted 4.6 billion years ago. Now by, by coincidence, that's about the same age as the earth and the sun. So when the light left this system, the sun and the earth were just being formed. In fact, the earth probably wasn't quite formed yet. The sun was just a contracting ball of gas at that time. It doesn't really mean anything. It's just a nice coincidence that the, the, the time it's taken the light to reach us uh, is the same time that it's taken the earth to go from creation to, to where we are today. Um, I'm told that some of you have, have tried to look for the, the Cheshire Cat. It is in the, the constellation Ursa Major. Um, but you can see why it's gotten all the attention, right? You have two very bright galaxies in the center. These are the two uh, eye galaxies. You have a nose galaxy in just the right place. And of course, uh, the gravitational lenses. Um, there are at least four different galaxies that have been lensed by this group. Uh, here's, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not. Here's one on the, the left side of the face, here on the right side of the face, got its smile, and then below the smile. There are a few other lenses uh, for which we don't have redshifts for. They could be a different galaxy or they could be a multiple of one of the four that we already know, but this is quite a high uh, mass concentration uh, to form you know, at least four different gravitational lenses from four separate objects. Um, the 4.6 billion light years, are those the eyes or the lens galaxies? Um, the eyes are in the, uh, oh, sorry, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the group itself. The lens galaxies are much, much further away than that. So they're more like, uh, if I had to guess, more like seven to 10 billion light years away. Um, their look back time would be correspondingly larger. So the, the 4.6 billion is that of the host, the constituent lens galaxies themselves, the lens galaxies are, are farther away than that by, by several billion uh, light years. Okay, um, so yeah, it, it's, it's, this is screaming for someone to do a press release on, right? It looks, it looks really, really nice, uh, especially with the, the Hubble image of it. You see all kinds of, of nice detail there. Um, uh, and, and, and I should say, I did not discover this, this, this lens. Um, this was found previously in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Um, and because of that, they, another group asked for the Hubble time for it and received that. Uh, I know an, an amateur astronomer in the US uh, dug it out of the archive and, and, and won some sort of contest they had for, uh, for pretty images. And they actually talked about it on one of the uh, US late night talk shows. Uh, right when I was working on it myself, I go, oh, if I'd worked just a little bit faster, it could have been <laughs> my work that they talked about on the talk show. But uh, people, people really liked this because it was, uh, it's so, you know, it's humorous to look at. Um, what was known previous to our work, um, let me see a question here. So because of the uh, redshift, we are seeing the, the lensed arc must be UV or X-ray radiation. Um, um, no, it's, um, the redshifting is about 40%. So uh, that's, that's like going from 5,000 angstroms in the optical to uh, 7,000 angstroms. So you're going from, from middle of the optical to the red part of the optical or from the red part of the optical into the infrared. It's not that, uh, it's not that large a shift to go from UV or X-ray all the way down the optical. It's about a 40% um, increase in the wavelength, um, given that it's at a redshift of 0.43. Um, also, uh, 1,800 kilometers per second um, is not six times the speed of light. The speed of light is 300,000 kilometers per second. Uh, so this is uh, um, a couple percent of the speed of light. But indeed, these two eyes, uh, it was previously known that um, uh, they had their redshift determined from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. They're bright enough. They're about 18th magnitude that there were um, velocities measured for them, and they differ by about 1,800 kilometers per second. So they're both, of course, moving away from us. The entire group is moving away from us because the universe is expanding. But in the reference frame of the group itself, those two are moving towards one another at 1,800 uh, kilometers per second. And that's, that's pretty fast in terms of galaxy movements around a group. We don't expect them to be that fast in a group that is, is relatively small like that. Uh, so that alone is suggesting that perhaps our original hypothesis for this uh, group is right, right? Um, if you have two, two groups moving towards one another, then um, they could indeed have that huge difference in velocity of 1800 kilometers per second. If they have just collided in the very recent past, they could retain that original velocity difference uh, that they had. So this, this large, relative velocity was our good clue that indeed these may be 
the central galaxies of separate groups that are now in the process of merging. And that's exactly what we're looking for. We're looking for the progenitors of what will become a fossil group in the future. When these two eyes merge together into one super galaxy, they will be two magnitudes brighter than the second brightest galaxy. It'll be a fossil group once those two, uh, those two eyes come together. They haven't yet from our perspective, but when they do, this should become a fossil group. This is what we believe to be a fossil group progenitor. But we have to prove though, that the method that we described is correct. Is this actually two groups that have come together or was it simply one group and you had one lone galaxy come in by itself, which really isn't a group group merger. It's just a one rogue galaxy that is joining an already formed uh, group. So that's the main, the main question that we wanted to, to, uh, to answer at the time. Do you expect the merged super galaxy in the middle of a young fossil group to always be an elliptical galaxy as they would normally be the collision of two major galaxies? In this case, we would. Um, if you combine, if you merge two spirals, like the Milky Way and M31 will in about 4 billion years, all the gas that we have in, in the disks of these two galaxies is going to be converted into star formation all at once. And there'll be a huge starburst that will happen when you merge two spirals. Now that's that, that, that happens for about a couple billion years, and then that dies away, and you're left with an elliptical in the center. So when our, when our Milky Way and, and Andromeda galaxy merge, the end result will be an elliptical, but in the meantime, it will be a spectacular fireworks of star formation uh, as that all that, that, that cold gas in each of the disks gets used up. That will not be the case for these two galaxies because they're already ellipticals. They don't have any cold gas within them. There's no way to make any new stars within them. They will simply merge to form a bigger uh, galaxy that's twice as massive and twice as many stars uh, as each one is individually. So they should remain an elliptical galaxy. Okay, so we have our hypothesis, but we want to tell whether are these actually two separate groups that are coming together. Um, and it turns out that um, we can do that. Uh, if we can take the spectrum of the object and we can determine how fast it is moving within the group itself. Um, the concept that I'm sure many of you are already familiar with, if you've ever taken spectra, you understand what, of course, what a spectrum is and that you can, you can drive how fast an object is moving either towards or away from you based on how some spectral feature has changed relative to where you expect that to be. So for example, if you're looking at an emission or an absorption line from, from hydrogen, you know where it ought to be from, from atomic physics. It's always gonna be at the same wavelength if that object is at rest relative to you. If that object is coming towards you, it's gonna be blue shifted. It's gonna to go towards the, the lower uh, wavelengths. If it's moving away from you, then it's going to be red shifted. And that feature will appear at a longer wavelength than it would if that object is at rest. Now, since we're talking about galaxies and galaxies are moving away from us, really everything's gonna be red shifted here. We don't see any galaxies other than M31 uh, that are blue shifted. Um, and Hubble's law, Edwin Hubble uh, predicted and showed that um, the farther away a galaxy is, the faster it's moving. That's, that's what Hubble's law is. So the bigger the shift, the faster it's moving away from us, the farther away it must be. It's a nice linear relation between these quantities that allows us to tell not only how fast is that galaxy moving relative to us, it also tells us how far away that particular galaxy is. Now, when we do that for a collection of galaxies, inside the Cheshire Cat, that'll tell us which ones are at the same distance as those two eye galaxies and which ones may be very much in the foreground or very much behind. If we measure its velocity, if its redshift is around 0.43, we can safely put it in that particular group. Yeah, good point. Redshift is only seen along the line of sight. How do you find velocities perpendicular to the line of sight? The question is we don't. Uh, given the great distances, these galaxies, you'd have to wait forever to see any velocity along your line of sight. This redshifting only works towards or away from you. So when we say that those two galaxies are, are uh, different in velocity by, um, by 1800 kilometers per second, that's really a lower limit. That's only the difference in their towards and away from us velocity. Side to side, we don't quite know. We don't have any way of measuring that directly. As I'll show in a few more slides, we think that they probably is very little uh, transverse velocity. It's probably nearly all line of sight, but we have that from indirect means, which I'll get to in, in just a second. 
Can simulations explain the origin of fossil galaxies, the illustrious? Uh, yes, they can. Um, and they do indeed predict that you should be able to make uh, 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 fossil groups this way. Um, these kind of uh, simulations were going on around the same time that we were doing this. So they, they were indeed predicting that, uh, you know, how fossil groups should form, uh, whether how many fossil groups you destroy over time by new merging, and whether you can form them by mergers later. So yes, the illustrious project has done quite a bit of work on this, um, on this project. Okay, so um, if we want to tell how far away a galaxy is, we have to measure how fast it's moving away from us. And to do that, we need to take uh, the spectrum of a, of a variety of, of galaxies in the, in the group. So we did that. Um, uh, we uh, ultimately got time on the Gemini telescope. Now I wanted to just take a little bit of time to tell you uh, what it's like to go, to go observing. I, I am by no means an, an optical astronomer aficionado. I just kind of dabble here and there in optical astronomy. Um, I'm mainly an X-ray astronomer, uh, but I have gone to a couple of telescopes. Uh, when I was a research scientist at the University of Michigan, I went to the MDM telescope. One of the M stands for Michigan. Uh, that's located on Kitt Peak in the southwestern part of the United States. And there's a, a 2.4 meter and a 1.3 meter telescope uh, that are there that people at Michigan have, have access to. So I got some time on there. Um, you're pretty much on your own. Uh, you're by yourself all night. You move the telescope yourself. You point it to where you want. You even fill up the doer with, uh, with uh, coolant so that the CCD stays cool. You do that every day. So you're completely on your own for that kind of observing. Uh, I've done that a few times. I've also gone to um, the Magellan Telescope, which is a 6.5 meter telescope in Chile, in South America, also through uh, my, my former affiliation with the University of Michigan. And uh, you can go there, but uh, they don't let you touch the telescope. Uh, we are not trusted to, <laughs> we might break it if we touch it. So they have uh, telescope operators who do all the movement of the telescope. They're sitting there right next to you all night. So you don't do something crazy like run to the dome and touch the telescope. Uh, but, but the role of the astronomer is to do things like set the exposure time, set what filter you want, uh, which object you want to look at. But the actual physical controls to move the telescope, that is all uh, handled by the, uh, uh, by the operator. And then we have Gemini which is an eight meter telescope. Uh, there are actually two of them. One is in Chile, one is in Hawaii. Uh, and in that case, you don't even go to the telescope. Um, you stay at home. The operator does everything in what they call a uh, Q observing. Um, and uh, um, you wait at home and you're, you're not even online at the same time they're doing that. It's not like you have any feedback at all. You wait a few days, they send you an email, say, come download your data and that's it. So with Gemini, there is no real observing experience like there is for, for some of the other telescopes. We have a question here. Uh, graphs of lenses can create curved images, duplication, nice and cross. Can one assume that there are actually many more lens objects in the sky, but that the distant objects, uh, uh, the distant object only is repositioned when we observe it. Uh, so no big uh, distortion of the light uh, beside the repositioning as with the star. Oh, you mean just shift it over? Um, yes, that is probably possible if, uh, the, the shift, if the, the mass distribution was so pure, was so symmetric that you moved the system over a bit without duplicating it. Um, um, how you'd actually tell that it was moved or not, I wouldn't know. If there's only one image, how do you know whether it's been moved or whether it's been, um, whether that's the original one or not? So that's an interesting question, but I'm not sure there would be any way to tell whether, you, whether that object is repositioned by gravity or whether it was really there to begin with. Um, we will probably never have a good enough model for the mass distribution of the lens to really say how you can expect any particular object to change when all you have is a single object at the very end. But that's an interesting question. I, I like that. Okay. Um, so um, we were fortunate enough to get uh, five hours of exposure time on the eight meter uh, Gemini North telescope. And it was my, my collaborator, uh, Rodrigo Carrasco, who really handled this. He's way, way better than me at this. He um, uh, planned the, uh, the optical observations and, and made sure they, they happened. Um, now, um, we wanted spectra of as many galaxies in the field as we could so that we could determine their velocities. Uh, now, you could put uh, one uh, you know, narrow slit down on each galaxy and then go to the next and then go to the next, and you could collect your spectra one by one. But of course, that would be very time consuming. Uh, so, so what they do on these large telescopes like Gemini is 
you build what's called a mask. Uh, so, so you first take a very brief image. This is the pre-image taken with Gemini. It doesn't look nearly as nice as the Hubble uh, image, but that's okay. We just want to know where the galaxies were and which ones were the best candidates to, uh, to, to take a spectrum. Um, so when we did so, this is not the actual mask. I, I couldn't find the mask for which we actually had. This is one that I took off the internet. Uh, but you make a basically a metal sheet and you carve uh, uh, these horizontal uh, slits, openings in the, um, in the metal sheet at the location of the galaxies that you want to get a spectrum of, right? So you can get dozens and dozens of galaxy spectra all at once. You put this in the path of the, uh, um, of the, uh, the telescope beam and uh, your galaxies would fall at the center of all these slits because you have carved your slits to make that happen. So we did this, um, we made two different masks um, combined. We were able to get about, I think it was 75 objects, excuse me, 75 objects total on the mask. Um, and we laid them down one after another, one for two and a half hours and the other one for two and a half hours. And we got our spectra of all the objects. Um, the ones that are blue, red or green were objects that we had a slit laid down for and we were able to get the spectrum of that galaxy. I'll explain in a bit uh, why the colors are different. Where you see the, uh, the uh, yellow X's here, these were galaxies that we could not fit on here. Okay, there's only so much space that you can fit on two masks. We had to give up on these yellow potential galaxies of the Cheshire Cat and only focus on the ones that could fit uh, on the screen. But we still got quite a few at that point. And everything that has a color other than yellow here, that was one of the uh, galaxies for which we got a spectrum for. So we got our results. We got, surprisingly enough, what we were expecting. Um, a number of the galaxies had velocities that were inconsistent with being in the group. They were either much closer or much farther behind the group. So we threw those out. Those were all the, the yellow crosses that we have here. Um, but there were in total uh, 48 galaxies that had velocities that correspond to redshifts that were close enough to our two uh, eye galaxies, for which we already knew what their velocities were, that we can confidently say that we have 48 galaxies that belong in this entire group. Right? And they are shown by the, uh, the, the red boxes and the, and the blue boxes here. Those all uh, confidently belong to uh, the Cheshire Cat. Now, if you take um, a, uh, a, a nice relaxed system of galaxies, and you let them whiz around the galaxy, the center, the group center for a billion years, they will sort of realign their velocities such that you get one nice, what's called a Gaussian or bell curve. You'll have a peak at the center wavelength. You'll have some that are going a little slower, some that are going a little faster, uh, but you'll have a single peak if you have a nice relaxed system. You can see here that we do not have a relaxed system. We have a group of galaxies that we've called G1, there were 19 galaxies that had a velocity that were close enough to the eastern eye, so that is the, the blue one right here, uh, that we, we identified them with a subgroup that came along with the eastern eye. And then we had a, a sample of 29 galaxies that were close enough in velocity to the western eye, which is right here in the, in the red box, um, that we think that that came from that group, right? So we think that we have, we have proved our hypothesis. We had two different groups. One was centered on the eastern eye, 19 galaxies or so, at least that's a sample that we had, and the other group, slightly larger, on the red western eye, uh, and they came together along the line of sight. They are now joining into one site. This double peaked velocity distribution is a very strong indicator of a merger rather than a nice relaxed system where you'd only have a single broader peak um, that would be representative of a more relaxed velocity structure of all these galaxies that are swimming around uh, inside the group. If you know the distance to the lensing object, can the radius be the lensed object uh, to the lensed object? Be used to estimate the lensing object's mass. Yes, actually you can, uh, and that's important because um, with some of these arcs that you see, um, the the length, the, the distance from the center, um, and if you know also the redshift of the object from behind, you can work through the mathematics, and it tells you how massive that. Uh, group is inside that ring. Okay, you, you don't get the mass outside that ring, you get it inside the ring. And this is important because when, when people do that, the mass that they get inside the ring is way larger than the mass of the galaxies and of the, the uh, hot gas. Does anyone know what the remaining mass is? 
Yes. It's dark matter. It's dark matter. That's one of the key evidence for dark matter. 90% of the mass in these groups and clusters is dark matter. Only 10% are galaxies and the hot gas. Uh, and the amount of mass that you, there's, there's more than one way to determine dark matter in a cluster. There's actually three different ways uh, with the gravitational lens being one of them. This is one of them. This is one of the ways and they all pretty much agree. They all agree that there's about 10 times more mass there than what you're seeing in the form of stars or in the forms of, of hot gas. So you're, you're right on the button with your question there. Uh, the, the radius does tell you how much mass is enclosed inside that arc. But that's a whole different talk if we want to talk about dark matter. <laughs> this talk is not about dark matter. So um, these two groups, we call them G1 and G2. We believe that they were, were separated groups. They each had a bright galaxy in their center. The two eyes were, were separated at one point. They merged mainly along that line of sight. They are now forming a supergroup where those two eyes are going to merge. And you will form a fossil group at this point. But for the moment, they still look quite uh, um, unrelaxed, quite young. Uh, these, these, this double peaked uh, velocity distribution tells us very strongly that this is not a relaxed system. This is a very young system. At least the, 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 uh, the output is very young. You just probably merge these two together in the relatively recent past. These galaxies have not had time to realign themselves into a single uh, bell curve shape. They're still showing two well separated distributions. Is the distance measurements of the two eyes accurate enough so it can be concluded that it is really a merger rather than two groups that run away from us uh, in parallel direct directories, but with a considerable axial separation. Ah, um, yes, uh, we can, and that's gonna be coming up in the next slide. So I'll save my answer until how we know if these aren't at just very, very different velocities that they actually are, are near one another. Um, but that will become clear once I talk about the, uh, the X-ray observations. So as I said, I'm an, I'm an X-ray expert more than I am optical. So at the same time we were uh, uh, gathering the optical data, we also uh, wrote a proposal to get observing time on the Chandra X-ray observatory. Now, X-ray observations are, are, are somewhat different from optical. Um, X-rays cannot penetrate the Earth's atmosphere. So there's no point in building an X-ray telescope on the ground. <laughs> they all have to go uh, into orbiting satellites. Uh, Chandra is, is one such observatory. It was launched by NASA back in 1999. Uh, it was launched from a, from a space shuttle in Florida. I went for the launch to go watch it. And with seven seconds to go, they scrubbed the launch. Um, and I had to go home. Uh, and I ended up having to fly back to Michigan. And I missed the actual launch four days later. So I'm, one of my great regrets in life is that they scrubbed this mission uh, seven seconds to go. But better safe than have it uh, not go into orbit. Um, but eventually went up and for the last 22 years has been sending back some of the best quality X-ray astronomy data uh, that we have. Um, now, um, a, an X-ray satellite like Chandra has a CCD, just like an optical telescope does, but it's a little different in which the way the data is collected. Uh, if you have an optical CCD, you have a, a grid of pixels and you measure the intensity of light at all of your pixels within your, your square array. Um, in X-ray astronomy, we don't have to do that. There are so few x-rays that are detected from astrophysical sources that actually you detect each x-ray individually. There are actually more x-rays than there are pixels, if you can believe that, um, typically for a typical observation. So for each time an x-ray is recorded, it'll get tagged individually with where it came from. So you can always make an image of that x-ray image. It comes with an energy, so you can always get a spectrum that you can create from your source. And actually, you know when the photon came to within a three second Time frame. So if you are interested in doing timing analysis, you can do it there. Okay? Unlike an optical astronomy, where you have to decide ahead of time, do I want an image, do I want a spectrum, or do I want a time series? You don't have to make such a decision with x-rays. You get all the information with a single observation every time. Right? Now with something like a, a hot gas from a cluster, we really don't care about time because it takes millions of years to change. We don't care about three seconds, but we can get a spectrum and we can get an image of the Cheshire cat uh, uh, based on the data collected with Chandra. Right? And here it is, right? This is the, the, the pinkish glow here is the smoothed X-ray image from that hot gas that permeates uh, this uh, Cheshire cat group of galaxies. And it's, it's put on top of the Hubble image. So you're seeing the, the optical here and then the pink glow is, is the hot X-ray emitting gas uh, on the order of 60 million uh, Celsius um, in, in, in temperature for the, for the center. 
Um, so our exposure time was, uh, I think X-ray astronomy is the only place uh, where you use the unit of time of kiloseconds, kiloseconds, so 70,000 seconds. I don't know who else uses kilosecond as a unit, but that was a little less than one day for, for the exposure time. Um, now to answer the question of, could these be two groups that were very well separated radially, but happened to be projected along, along the line of sight? We thought that might be the case, but the X-ray observation rules that out. If that were the case, then each group would have their own X-ray halo. So you would see a concentration here and you see a concentration here. Now, now don't be fooled. The, the concentration that looks like you're seeing here, this is actually the optical light from beneath it. If I showed you an X-ray only image, which I, I didn't bring one, it would be very smooth contours here with a centroid right smack dab in the middle of the two eye galaxies, right? Um, so rather than having two spatially separated halos, if these were really not touching one another, we believe that they've already merged, passed through one another, and the gas is realigning itself to be centrally concentrated at the new center of mass of the group, which is not at one eye and not at the other eye, but is about halfway in between, right? So that, that answers the previous question as to why we think that these two groups actually are physically in the same volume of space and not simply a projection along the line of sight. Now, another important thing that we got from the observation, not just that it was, it was pretty symmetrical, was that we were able to determine the temperature of the gas in, in two rings. We had an inner ring and we had the outer ring. Now, remember I said earlier, if you have a nice uh, relaxed cluster, you expect it to be cooler in the center and then somewhat hotter in the outskirts, okay? In this case, it was exactly the opposite. It was much hotter on the inside than it should have been, right? It should have been about a factor of three cooler than what we measured it to be, but it's hot, hotter here and somewhat cooler further out. Another key indicator that this is a merger. Something slammed together into this group relatively recently. It's still hot from the shock and it has not had time to cool down yet. So we have two key but completely independent pieces of information that tell us that this was a merger. We have the two different galaxy velocity distributions and we have the hot gas in the center indicative of, 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 a, of a merger. Uh, so we, we think we have finally uh, we did back in 2015, we saw this issue. We do believe that we had two galaxy groups that have merged along the line of sight and they will form uh, a fossil group at the future. Um, you wanna work through the numbers, given the temperature of this gas, this corresponded to a, a Mach number of about two. In other words, the velocity of, of impact from the two groups was about twice that of the sound speed of the, uh, of the gas itself. So you, whenever you have a Mach number greater than one, you're gonna get shock heating and indeed, we see what we believe to be shock heating in the very center. That's why the temperature is higher in the center. Now, um, not, not evident from this image because you're seeing the optical beneath uh, the, uh, the x-rays. If you look at this eye right here, if I were to take away the optical and leave only the x-ray, you would see a point source right here in x-rays. It looks something like this. This is probably a, an unrelated uh, a quasar or active galactic nucleus that's emitting a lot in x-rays. And we see them were scattered along the sky, but there's also one exactly where the eye is. So if you could, uh, uh, in addition to this being a Cheshire cat, if you superimpose the x-ray, the uh, right eye, or the cat's left eye, is going to be glowing in x-rays. So that's, that's kind of interesting that, that if this image isn't spooky enough looking like the Cheshire cat, this eye is actually glowing brightly in x-rays, indicating that you have a very uh, supermassive black hole in the center of that galaxy that is being fed material and is emitting a lot of X-ray radiation as a result. Now, another uh, spooky thing about this eye, if you look very carefully at the Hubble image, that central, that, that uh, uh, Western eye galaxy is actually has two nuclei. This galaxy itself has merged in the, in the recent past, right? This is probably in the, in the process of becoming one completely merged galaxy, but you couldn't see it with, with ground-based uh, resolution. You really needed the full resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope to see that, yeah, this was probably two galaxies that have almost finished merging into one. So this eye, in addition to glowing brightly in x-rays, is also a double eye, very, a very creepy eye from this point of view that I don't think has been uh, uh, fully uh, uh, recognized by those who have not looked carefully at the, uh, at the high resolution Hubble image of this, uh, of this very fascinating uh, group. All right, so, um, this is kind of the final science slide I want to do is 
um, those two eyes. We said that they will merge one day and we can actually do a rough calculation on how long that will be from now. Given how far apart they're separated um, and how fast they're moving relative to one another, we can put an estimate on how long it'll take uh, dynamical friction to make them merge together and form our big super galaxy at the center. And it comes out to be about a billion years. So if the astronomers who come back in a billion years, if they look at the Cheshire cat, they should see a fossil group at that point. And I am hoping that the astronomers a billion years from now will cite my paper because I predicted it back in 2015. <laughs> You're gonna see it in about 1 billion years. Um, that's the hope at least. Um, and as such, we, we, we believe that this is the first demonstrated instance of a fossil group progenitor having been found. Uh, and it was found thanks to the fact that it had this very comical looking set of gravitational uh, lenses uh, that, is, uh, that is surrounding it. Um, now, uh, something I need to point out, remember that we're seeing the system as it looked 4.6 billion years ago, and that life's been traveling ever since. That's a lot longer than the time it'll take to merge. So if you were there in that system now, those galaxies have already merged, and that's already a fossil group. We won't be able to confirm until that light reaches us in about three and a half billion years. Um, but uh, um, because of the lag in time it takes for the light to reach us, we know that that system must already be a fossil group, but we can't call it that yet because that light from that merger won't reach us for quite some time. So um, that's, that's the limitations of living in a universe where the speed of light is not instantaneous. It takes time for light to go from one side of the universe to the other. We're just gonna have to estimate that, yeah, if you could be there right now, that would be one single galaxy because enough time would have passed for those two galaxies to merge. This project uh, turned into a, a project for my uh, PhD project for my uh, grad student at the time, Lucas Johnson. He started collecting more examples of fossil group progenitors. Uh, now these aren't all nice and pretty like the, the Cheshire cat, but they all contain gravitational lenses. Uh, and these are all Hubble images. And the green contours here show the, um, uh, the contours from Chandra. So rather than showing that pink glow, you can see the intensity map based on, on, the, on the circles here, but they're all progenitors. They are all have uh, uh, galaxy, uh, enough galaxies. They have the X-ray halo uh, and they will have that two magnitude gap by the time they all merge together with various look back times. Um, now these are all far enough away that we predict that if you were there today, they would be fossil groups. That is their look back time is greater than our estimated time for everything to merge together in their centers. So. We call them progenitors here, but in reality, they're probably already uh, fossil groups. Uh, and that was a project that I said went on to become the, the PhD dissertation of my grad student, uh, former grad student, Lucas Johnson. Um, so that's really, um, I know I went a lot longer than I said I was going to, sorry. Um, but um, that's really all that I wanted to say. Um, and I, I wanna thank you for inviting me here. And uh, I really enjoyed your, your really good questions that you've asked me. When I teach AY 101 every Tuesday, Thursday, and I say, are there any questions? I get nothing but silence. From <laughs> uh, but you guys have had some many, many good questions. And, and I thank you for, for, uh, for listening to the talk and, and coming up with some good questions. And I hope I was able to answer at least most of them um, satisfactorily well. So some of them, um, actually, I would say most of them, they were all found in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And Sloan only observed near the near the um, celestial equator and into the north. So I would say yes, they probably all, because of the fact that they were found by Sloan probably means they are all visible from the northern hemisphere.